Scaling the Web, Databases, and NoSQL. My name is Richard Schneeman. I currently work for Gowalla, and I'm going to be talking about some of my experiences both with databases, uh, relational, and using NoSQL. So a little bit about me. Who am I? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at Schneems. I graduated from Georgia Tech with a Bachelor's of Mechanical Engineering. Um, I then went on to work for a company called uh, National Instruments for a little while, did some, uh, did some software work with them, and uh, currently I am uh, following my passion, which is uh, using Ruby on Rails, Ruby being the programming language, Rails being a framework. I work for Gowalla. I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, what Gowalla is and how we use some of these features if you're not familiar with us. Uh, just a little bit more about me. I have exactly one line in uh, Rails 3.1, uh, so if you get, get the time, uh, feel free to ask me about that. I also uh, really enjoy teaching. Um, I have offered a couple of free classes to uh, University of Texas students and um, also teach with a company called, uh, called Engine Yard and have taught at a couple of conferences. Um, it's just something I, I enjoy doing. So, first of all, we're going to going to talk about scaling, scaling in the web. Whenever you talk about this, we're all going to be talking about traffic. Uh, and when, you, when you're talking about traffic, it's kind of important to, you know, not think in, in terms of 1 or 10 or 100, but uh, think, you know, real, as some people would say, web scale. So one example of this I like to give is uh, some open data that is published by Wikipedia. Here is a graph that Wikipedia has published of the number of articles on wikipedia.org. Um, you can see here they started in 2001, um, you know, no articles, and currently in 2011 they are fast approaching 4 million articles. You know, that's a lot of documents. You can see here it is slowing down a little bit, but, um, you know, still this number is growing and growing and growing. So, you know, 4 million is a, is a pretty large number. And then you, uh, you, you take a, uh, a look at how many times these articles are being edited. The, the articles aren't just being written once and then you know left alone. Every single article keeps on getting written to. So you have this compounding traffic. Um, you have a feature, articles, which it encourages people to come to your website. So the more articles you have, the more people are coming to your website. Um, also, the better your articles are, uh, the more edits that are being made to them, um, you will get more people to your website as well. So uh, essentially, all of this, all of this compounds. You have a kind of a, a compound growth, and um, so the the net effect is essentially just a ton of write traffic, a ton of read traffic, and it can grow exponentially. We take a look at these curves, and they are more or less exponential curves. We'd like to talk about Gowalla for a little bit. Gowalla was named uh, 50 Best Websites in New York Times uh, 2010. It was founded in 2009 at, uh, and, and launched at South by Southwest. Right, currently we have um, about a million plus users and many more visitors. Um, on Gowalla, you can love things, highlight things, comment things, create stories, you can create guides. We integrate with Facebook, Foursquare, Twitter, uh, we also have an iPhone, an Android, and a web app, including a public API. So whenever we're talking about traffic, you know these are all um, these are all things that go through Goal. They they have to uh, be processed by our servers. You know, not just uh, the the content creation, the creating of a story, the creating of a guide or a, of a highlight, uh, but also the reading of that, um, and not just by our users. Uh, you you might want to read your own data. From the uh, from Gowalla, but we also offer a, a public API um, and things like um, our spots, what what most people would call places, is available through our public uh, API. So you can through that API see what people have written about that spot. You can see how many people have been there, and so on and so forth. Get some get some information about that spot. Uh, and you know, a lot of people are very interested in these kind of things. Um, quite a few people have written web crawlers that you know just crawl and try to scrape a lot of our data. Uh, so it, you know, it, it really does add up to a lot of um, a lot of traffic. So if you're not familiar with Gowalla, we are a uh, exploration and um, uh, 
and, and travel based social location network, I guess, maybe maybe the best way to say that. I'm, I'm, I'm an engineer, I'm not uh, in marketing. Uh, here is just a, a quick screenshot of uh, my profile on the web. Um, you can see I've created a couple of different lists that, that contain uh, several spots I like to go to. Some of them are, are bookmarked. Um, I did a New Orleans trip and you know made a nice little list for that. And then we can also see a, a list of stories that I've been in. Um, and that is essentially uh, at a location. Uh, either I create a story or someone else creates a story and tags me in it. Um, and then you can add photos, you can add comments. Uh, it's, you know, it's really nice. We have these, uh, you can see all of the different states I've been to. I'm going to make a trip coming up to Tanzania pretty soon in uh, January. Looking forward to maybe getting, uh, getting some different countries on, on those pins. Um, we also uh, have an iPhone app and an Android app in, the, in this uh, bottom right-hand corner. You can just see kind of a, a quick screenshot of it. And on that screen, we're showcasing our guides, which is a way to explore popular locations, especially in the U.S. Uh, we do have some, you know, well, actually plenty outside of the U.S. Um, another thing we're known for uh, is just incredible art, incredible art direction. Here's some of, uh, you know, just a, an illustration of a famous landmark that was done in Chicago. So just to kind of give you an idea of you know, what people can do on Gowalla and, you know, what type of a user experience you might expect. <clears throat> so the back end of Gowalla, um, all of those things, the web app, the iPhone app, the Android app, all of those use uh, this exact same back end. Uh, to accomplish that, we use Ruby on Rails, uh, where Ruby is a programming language and Rails is a framework. I understand that you all have been uh, working with and... Uh, and learning uh, PHP. PHP is similar in nature, I guess, to, uh, to Ruby on Rails, um, to Ruby anyway. Uh, it, is, it is a scripting language, uh, whereas uh, Rails would be more like if you're using Cake PHP, some sort of a framework. So to get our bearings straight on, before I actually go into the, the heart of uh, storing data, I uh, just want to say that the web is data. Anything that you see on the web is data, and you know that might sound um, obvious to some people, or it might sound like you know I have no idea what this guy is talking about to other people. But whenever you see a username or, or a birthday or a blog post, all of those uh, or an image, all of that is data, and it has to be stored somewhere. If it's not stored anywhere, it's not going to be useful. You know, if it if the web page only works the first time somebody ever sees it, and then you know never reloads ever again, it's not going to do us any good. Um, so to store these things, we, we can map them to data types in, in computer science. Um, so we might want to store a username as a string. A birthday might be a series of integers or possibly a string as well. A blog post, we want it instead of, typically whenever you say string, you're limiting to 255 characters. A blog post, um, you might want it to be longer than that. So we're going to say it's going to be text and that can be unlimited length. An image isn't a string, it isn't an integer, so, you know, what is it? Um, it's probably going to be a binary flop file, or you can save it as a blob. So, you know, those are just some generic things that, you know, definitely you've seen on the Internet. Uh, so, you know, now that we have these things and we know what we want to store them as, a string, an integer, uh, you know, text, we have to put them somewhere. So that leads us to a database. Uh, database is where we store things in Gowalla. Uh, we use PostgreSQL. It is a relational database or a RDBMS. Typically that's what you'll see abbreviated. Um, it is open source, uh, completely free, a competitor to MySQL. It does very similar things to MySQL. It is ACID compliant and we will talk about what exactly ACID compliant means in, in a little bit. And, um, you know, currently we have it running on a dedicated managed server. So whenever you're talking about data, you're talking in terms of, you know, just having the data, sure. But uh, we also want things to be performant and we want to, uh, we want to be able to see them quickly. So some, some terminology I'll be using, uh, throughput is the number of operations per minute that can be performed. <clears throat> you can think of this in terms of the number of cars that can go through a tollway in an hour or, you know, in a minute. 
Whereas pure speed is how long an individual operation takes, where that would be how fast can one car go? You know, can it go 200 miles an hour? Um, how fast can one car go through that tollway? So those are two different definitions of speed, and they're both uh, both important. You need to, if you want, you know, if you want pure speed, but you have, um, you know, millions upon millions of users uh, requesting operations and trying to read things, trying to write things, uh, you know, then your throughput will be a bottleneck and they won't get that speed. No one will see that speed. So in order to be fast, you have to have both throughput and speed. So here are some potential problems with a database um, or any kind of a, a data store with uh, regards to speed. We can have hardware problems, so we can have a, a slow network, we can have a slow hard drive, we can not have enough uh, processing power, we can have not have enough um, you know, memory, not enough RAM. Uh, and you know, those are all hardware problems. We can also have software problems too. If we write our software inefficiently, uh, you know, maybe too many reads, too many writes. Um, you know, we can also have a social problem that I didn't list here where our software just becomes exponentially, uh, exponentially more used. Lots and lots and lots of people are flocking to our software and we see growth that we didn't expect. Uh, you know, this is uh, not quite seen as much nowadays, but in the early days of the web, um, there are, you know, some famous services that you know, kind of built their service and you know, they didn't even think about scaling. You know, scaling wasn't even in, not, uh, <clears throat> on their, the tip of their tongues or anything. Uh, so anyway, those are three factors we have to consider when, um, when thinking about speed and databases. <clears throat> so if you want to get more speed out of your database, there are two things you can do. You can either scale up and this entails uh, increasing that hardware. Uh, and this is going to be, you know, bigger hard drive, more RAM, um, you know, uh, moving it, moving your database closer to your, um, your web servers, that kind of thing. Uh, we can also scale out. So, you know, that's just adding more and more machines. Yeah, so scaling up, it unfortunately uh, is <clears throat> bound by Moore's law. We can only fit so many transistors into one machine. We, uh, the the biggest, fastest single computer that exists is still, you know, not as fast as two of the biggest, most powerful single computers that exist together. Um, so uh, you know, we do want to have very performant, very good hardware on our machines. Uh, but again, you know, we. Uh, uh, run into Moore's Law. In, in addition, you keep on throwing money at this and the newest hardware that, that comes out uh, costs you know, quite a bit of money, whereas uh, the performance gains you see might not be uh, as dramatic. So in addition to scaling up, we can also scale out. And this is where, this is, you know, this is the computer scientist's uh, uh, dream. You just say, oh, forget scaling up, we're just going to scale out. It's simple. We all, we just had to add more nodes, and, and that's uh, you know scaling horizontally. So you just every time you run into needing more uh, more power, you just add um, add additional nodes. So for a database, for actually storing that data, that can mean one of two things. We can have a, a master slave database architecture, or we can start sharding our database. So to get a look of what that would look like. Um, this is a master-slave architecture. So all of our writes come in and they hit our master database. We have many, many, many slave databases set up to just automatically copy everything that comes into the master database. They're not getting the raw queries, um, the you know the raw insert statements that are coming from the, the master database. Essentially, it's master database already figures out where in memory to put those, and the slaves just say, "Oh, okay, you know, I see," and then they just you know write that exact same thing to disk. Uh, so it is you know, a, a little bit less uh, write intensive for them. Um, but then what you can do is you can say, all right, we're doing all of our writes through our master database. All we're going to do is read from our slaves. Um, we're not going to do any single read from our, our master database. Um, and this is going to help us with our, um, our throughput.
we get, um, you know, if you can approach the maximum number of reads just from your master database, if you add five slaves, then you can serve five times the number of reads, um, essentially. So master and slave uh, you know, pros and cons. Um, the pro is we get increased read speed. It takes load off the master. We're not, you know, we're not reading as much. Um, <clears throat> and we can join across all tables. If you guys have done any joins, great, you understand that. If not, um, we'll get to it in a little bit. Uh, so some cons. It doesn't buy increased write throughput. Uh, you know, maybe a little bit by taking some load off of the, the, the master server. But um, if writing your data is your bottleneck, then it's not going to solve that. It, it also We also have a single point of failure in the master uh, database. So if the master database goes down, you know, our entire system goes down. We're, we're pretty much, you know, we're in hot water. Uh, so one of our other alternatives that we can do is sharding. And sharding is kind of cleverly splitting up our data uh, among um, obvious boundaries. In, in this case, um, there's kind of a contrived example. I've uh, chosen to split up our users among multiple uh, geographic boundaries. So each one of our users um, in the USA or Europe or Asia or Africa is going to get a completely different server. Um, and, you know, this is great. We can increase our read and write throughput uh, for, this, for, this one, for this one feature, this, the, the users. Um, we also no longer have a single point of failure. Um, individual features can fail. So, you know, maybe your European user server gets slammed um, and it goes down. Well, don't worry, you know, your USA and Africa and all the other ones are still up. Um, you can just bring the Europe one up whenever you get a chance. Um, it does have one con, and this is a, a pretty big con, that uh, you can't join queries between shards. So whenever you're splitting up your data, um, you need to know that the silos, you won't actually need to access data in between the silos. Um, if you're doing something along the lines of Gowalla, where you have, um, you know, you have friends, you can, you can, or you can follow people. Um, even though I'm in the U.S., I have, uh, we actually have a pretty big following in Sweden as well as uh, Asia, and uh, you know, some people have followed me from Asia, and um, you know, if this feature was split up in this way, uh, it would be difficult to to do that mapping um, successfully across this sharding pattern. So that was uh, speed and databases and two ways to kind of, you know, speed them up. You've seen some pros, you've seen some cons, but what exactly is a database? I said RDBMS previously, that stands for a Relational Database Management System. Um, typically, whenever someone says database, they are talking about an RDBMS, Relational Database Management System, but it doesn't always mean so you can actually, you can refer to a, a database, a NoSQL um, database that, you know, such a thing exists. A, a lot of people, for clarity's sake, will call those data stores, where a data store is a superset of a database. A database is a data store, if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, back to the slide. A database, uh, we're going to store data using a schema. And uh, databases are typically, or relational databases are typically, ACID com, uh, compliant. So that means atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. So relational database. You might have heard this a couple of times, but you know what exactly does relational mean in terms of our data? Um, so inside of a relational database, we are going to split up our data upon common, uh, common lines. For instance, if we are doing some sort of an order um, order taking application, we might have a, a customers table, and we might have an orders table. Uh, you know, this makes sense. You, why would you, you know, store order data in the customer table? Um, but then you you get to the problem of saying, all right, well, I have this customer, and you know, they they have an ID or they have a they have an order, but how do I actually get to that data? How do I get to that order? <clears throat> Um, because a relational database is relational, um, we have these things called foreign keys and primary keys, which is a, a bit too long-winded to get into in full depth here. But here we can see that the order has a customer ID, 
and this is going to keep track of the ID of the customer. So for an example, um, if, you know, my name is Richard, if I am customer ID of three, if I have an order, maybe I'm, I'm buying a book. Um, that book will have a customer ID of three. The book knows that it, it is my order. Um, it, this, is, this is nice because we can do things like uh, join that data. We can join across that common um, ID, and we can also use a union. <clears throat> um, but in reality, like the, the best part about a relational database is it makes data modular, and it, they're very configurable. You can model you know, really almost about any type of relationship that you want inside of a relational database. Um, you know, it is very, they are very much a, a Swiss Army knife. So some pros of relational databases. Um, the data is, is modular. You know, this is great. If you only want the customer information, you only pull that. You don't have to pull the customer and all of their order information. But um, it, it's highly flexible data layout. If you want, you know, if you wanted to put all of that information under the customer, you could. Um, you can change around things, uh, you know, fairly easily. Um, we do have a couple of cons, though. Getting the desired data can be tricky. Uh, if you are not familiar with relational algebra, uh, databases are kind of built on the theory of relational al algebra. Or if you're not familiar. Just with databases in general, uh, I, I mentioned uh, primary and foreign key previously. Well, here we have uh, the customer ID and the ID. Um, if you know that wasn't intuitive to you at uh, the first mention, you know that's you're not to be blamed. It's not an easy concept, and um, it's not. There's not many real world analogs, um, or that you know analogs that we, you would see occurring in nature. I'll say. <clears throat> um, so, you know, also how we structure our data affects how we get our data back out. <clears throat> so if we over-modularize, we make, you know, users and then uh, our customers and then customer settings, then customer preferences, um, and, you know, 10 other things related to customers, we, we uh, you know, make it too modular, then whenever you want to get that data back out, you have to build a big nasty join query in order to get that back in, and um, you know that uh, very large queries uh, can actually take down a database. You know, maybe not in that example, but um, you know, if you were joining all of the users in Gowalla against all of our places or, or spots as we call them, then you know that could easily um, you know put the database down to a crawl, if not just kill it altogether. Um, so because of this, because of the modularization and the way we're structuring our data, um, we're, we're kind of trading off performance for uh, searchability. When we put data into a relational database, we're saying, <clears throat> to go back to this example, um, you know, I might want to be able to uh, pull out my orders by an order date. So I'm going to separate my order date from everything else. Or I might want to find a customer based on name, so I'm going to separate that from everything else. Um, so we, you know, you can build this database and not know how you're going to access your data, not know how you're going to use it, um, which you know, it, it, again, is is great. It's it's fantastic in terms of uh, being able to multitask, but it is a performance trade off. Um, the the underlying performance of the software, um, you know, when the database was originally being built, being written. Um, Obviously, they optimize for speed, but it's difficult to be very flexible and very fast at the same time. So um, a database has schema. A schema is a blueprint for data storage. Uh, schema is how we tell the database that we're going to break our data into different tables, different columns, and different rows. Um, we also want to type our data. So, you, for instance, we might say that the ID of our user is going to be an integer and their name is going to be a string. Um, if they have a bio, maybe that's longer than 255 characters, that would probably be a text field. Um, you know, for our application, we might want to know some other things. Perhaps, are they married? Have they purchased something before? Um, you know, those, that's a yes or no question uh, where we can store that in a Boolean field. Um, 
So some quick pros and uh, cons about that. It helps us regularize our data. It also helps keep our data consistent. <clears throat> when we are doing these complex inserts and joins and, and, um, and operations, maybe you know, we're doing maximums and minimums and counts, uh, it, it's nice. Our, our database needs to know what type of a data it's working with. Um, you know, it's also going to put some constraints on our data, which is actually good. It's not going to, going to let, if you have a field called price, it's not going to let you save A, B, C, D, E, F, G to that field. It's also really convenient in that our schema converts um, programming uh, to programming types very easily. So if you know if you pull a integer in uh, out of your database, you know that it maps very readily to say an integer in Ruby, an integer in uh, PHP. <clears throat> um, so now some cons: the schema has to be separately managed, which is um, you know not that big of a deal, but uh, if you have to add columns or indexes to already existing very large tables, it can be painful and slow. <coughs> um, you, you know, if you're looking to add a, uh, it, you know, can take hours uh, to add these. It's, it's not just a, a trivial thing. When, again, when we're working, you know, quote unquote web scale, and you're thinking in terms of, you know, not the thousands, but the millions or the billions, trillions in some cases, um, you know, these somewhat trivial operations when you don't have much data is, you know, very, very, very slow and painful uh, and can actually limit your mobility, limit how quickly um, you can move. So, um, you know, again, having schema is nice, but there are some downsides to it. Um, another thing with having to manage your schema before you even start developing, you have to tell your data how you want it to look. So, you know, before I even have a user object, I have to say, okay, my user has a name and my user has a, a phone number and, you know, all these other things. And um, invariably, you will end up with fields that you, you know, you thought you needed. You know, maybe you think your app needs a username and then 10 weeks down the road, it doesn't. Or, um, you know, maybe you don't think your app needs an email address and, you know, for the user. And then 10 weeks down the road, you're like, oh, man, I really need to store email addresses. So um, it, you, you have to, you know, have all of that up front. Um, the, the database doesn't really adapt on the fly to, you know, what you want to do. Um, so that's, those, are, those are some concepts um, with the database itself. Now I'd like to talk about ACID. If, uh, if you don't follow along 100% completely, don't worry, this is a, a bit high level, but um, ACID is something that um, a good data store is supposed to conform to. So these are property that guarantee a database transaction are processed reliably. Uh, ACID stands for Atomic, Consistent, Isolated, and Durable. So first off, we're going to start with Atomic. Uh, so atomic means that any any database transaction is all or nothing. So if one part of the transaction fails, it all fails. Essentially, when you're saying we want our, our database to be atomic, we're saying that an incomplete transaction cannot exist. Um, an example of this might be if you had an order that was being completed and a uh, you also had some sort of a shipment model, you might want to mark the order as completed and the product as shipped at the same time. <clears throat> if either one of those um, in the same transaction throws an error or, you know, maybe somebody tried to put in the wrong price, they tried to put in prices ASDF in one of those, then that would throw an error and um, at the end of it we would essentially, uh, you know, the database would, would roll itself back or should roll itself back. So an incomplete transaction cannot exist. It wouldn't just store half of that. We want our database to be consistent. So we're saying that any and all transactions that do complete will take, take the database from one consistent state to another. Another way of saying this is that only consistent data is allowed to be written. Um, you know, for it, we can't have, um, you know, half of our data be... Uh, you know, an integer and the other half be string on the same field and it needs to all be the same. It needs to be consistent across everything. 
Um, another very important one is isolated. Uh, this is saying that no transaction should be able to interfere with another transaction. If two users uh, are trying to update the same field at the exact same time, you know, at the exact same millisecond, um, then it we, we they just should not be allowed to do that. That would put um, the database in an unknown state. So essentially the same field cannot be updated by two or more sources at the exact same time. Uh, here in this example we have you know A being set to zero and then simultaneously A is being incremented by one and A is being incremented by two. Well, you know, what is the value of A? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Well, you know, we don't know if all, is it zero? If, if all of those occur at the exact same moment, then, um, you know, depending on uh, an, an indeterminate state, you know, A could be any of those things. So because we don't know, uh, we are going to, we're going to not allow this to happen. We're basically going to essentially not save any of those. All right, the final part of ACID is durable. So once we actually get around to saving that data, we're saying it's going to it's going to be around for a while. It's not just we're not just, you know, saving it and no, we're going to have to save it again later. And before we close the database down, we're going to have to, you know, save the whole the whole database and commit it to disk and put it in a new uh, folder. Okay, no, once you save it, uh, once you can read it forever until you modify it or delete it. Um, you know, or, you know, delete the database. Uh, so durable is also very important. If, you're, if your data is not durable, you could theoretically write a email address down to the user table, and then go back to read that email address, and it's just not there, and you don't know why. Uh, and that's, you know, that's really bad. <laughs> you, if, you, if you have data that is worth saving, or if you have data that, that you want to save, it is worth saving um, to be read and, you know, again, there are some options as far as that goes, but, uh, you know, generally that is true. Uh, so you want your data store to be ACID. Uh, so if you're talking with someone about data stores and they mention ACID, this is what they're referring to, the, the, those four principles. Um, if you don't, you know, completely follow, don't worry. It's not crucial to the understanding, but just know that these are um, four things that data stores strive for. Um, also, we, we, can, we can get... Uh, we can get performance increases by trading off, by not doing any single one of these things. Uh, typically, there is overhead associated with, uh, with you know, saving thing, something forever as opposed to just kind of saving for it for in the now. And, you know, we'll get over, get into that in just a bit. Uh, so, again, just to kind of sum up, we have a, a database being relational. <clears throat> Um, you know, which again means it's modular. We can also put that data back together. It's flexible. It has a schema. Uh, most likely is going to be ACID compliant. Not all databases are. Um, some of them, just for minor technicalities, but typically relational databases are ACID compliant. And uh, generally, whenever we talk about a database, it is fast, either under low load or when optimized. Um, in no way, shape, or form am I ever trying to say that a database is slow. Um, databases are op you know, written for speed, and uh, you know, it's what enterprises run on, uh, typically. Uh, and and uh, until relatively recently, it, it was all we had in terms of mass data storage. So uh, databases certainly are fast, but it, it drastically depends on the conditions in which you're using them on. Uh, so now that we've covered what a database is, we're going to talk a little bit about what is SQL. Some people might also call it SQL. So SQL stands for Structured Query Language. <clears throat> Basically, this means it is the, uh, the language that databases speak uh, it's based on relational algebra, and you can do typically um, insert query update delete statements to your database, and the database will understand these. Um, it also has another one called schema, which we talked about schema a little bit, where you can manipulate the schema. Uh, and here's an example of some SQL. Select company uh, and country from customers where country is equal to USA. Um, you know, which is perfectly readable. I, I just said that, and you can imagine that it's going into the customer's table, 
and it's looking at all of the different countries and looking for one that has USA in it. And then, you know, of all of those, it's pulling out the company and the country. So, uh, you know, it makes, makes sense when you read it. Um, so for that reason, some people like SQL. They love SQL. Um, you know, it's very well understood. It's very well documented. It's been around for a very long time. Uh, also, relational algebra is, is powerful. As I mentioned, you know, we can, we can join items and union items across, uh, across uh, foreign and primary keys as well as other fields, um, and it, that is incredibly powerful. You can do a lot of things. Uh, I worked on an analytics application that had, um, I think, uh, you know, 600 million entries in one, um, in one table, and we actually had to do a join on itself. Uh, or, I mean, we, no, sorry, sorry, that's not correct. We were able to group, um, uh, essentially do one operation across this entire 600 million entries, and, um, you know, it came back in a couple of seconds, which isn't super quick, but at the same time, it, you know, it came back, it was, it was able to do that operation, uh, and if I had split that out into, you know, multiple, um, you know, pulling all of that data into memory and manipulating it with Ruby, um, I actually tried that, and that took about 30 minutes. So uh, SQL can be very, very powerful, and that's what I mean when I say that it's, it's fast, or sorry, databases are fast, either under low load or, you know, when they're heavily optimized. If my data, if my problem is represented perfectly by SQL, then, you know, why not, why not use a relational database and SQL? Um, because I will see, you know, the, the best results. So here's an example of why just some people don't like SQL. Uh, relational algebra is hard. Uh, the, the, the select statement I presented earlier makes sense when you read it, but it can get very very complex very quickly. Um, also, different databases support different subsets of SQL, and it, it is still a programming language, so it's still something that you have to learn. Uh, it, a lot of it is kind of this native speech type of a, of a, of a language, but you know, not all of it is. Um, there's a lot of uh, caveats that you're going to run into, especially if you get really, really, really good at one database, say MySQL or uh, Postgres, then you'll, uh, going over to another database, you'll find that doing the exact same operation that was screaming fast in one is super slow in the other. So both of them have different optimization paths. Uh, and that's completely dependent on the, on the database. Uh, so one last thing to take away from this is that uh, SQL is not a database. SQL is used to talk to a database, but SQL is not a relational database. Um, you can use SQL to talk to a NoSQL database. That's a little bit uh, beyond the scope of this talk. And um, typically if you're doing that, as most people will say, you're doing it wrong. That's, that's a pretty big indication. If you can use SQL on your relational database, then that's a um, pretty good indication that you should just model your data, or sorry, in, in a non-relational database, that you should model your data in a relational database. I think I got that right. Anyway, um, SQL is for relational data. So use SQL when you want relational data. So what is NoSQL? Anybody? All right, NoSQL is essentially not a relational database, which makes sense. <clears throat> it's unfortunate that they you know, chose NoSQL as opposed to no relational database or not a relational database, um, but unfortunately, you know, NoSQL was eh, pretty catchy. And uh, in addition to that, it's a lot shorter, you know, relatively concise, and a lot of people, when they first interact with writing SQL, they hate it. They absolutely hate it. They just want their data. They don't want to learn SQL. Um, think it's unnecessary. Lots of people have written uh, object relational mappers to you know kind of get around it, and even then, you still have to know SQL. So uh, it, it's understand understandable. But the the naming of NoSQL was more a kind of a marketing. Uh, term. Not that any one firm was behind it, but you know, it, it was catchy. So here are some types of NoSQL. 
uh, since we have uh, all relational databases are going to be roughly the same. But with NoSQL, it's more of an ecosystem. So you'll have NoSQL uh, data stores that are distributed. You can have document stores. You can have uh, graph stores, graph database stores. Uh, most likely, if you're working with NoSQL, you will end up encountering a key value store. Um, that's the most uh, most prominent, most common type of NoSQL store, as well as um, eventually consistent systems. So it, it doesn't mean that if you if you're talking about NoSQL, it doesn't mean that it is all of these or it is one of these. You know, we can mix and match. We can have it can be a graph database with eventually consistent system or you know a, a distributed system. And it also doesn't mean that a, this can't re apply to a relational database. Um, you know, for instance, we could use, uh, say, Postgres or MySQL just as a key value store purely if we only wanted to use ID and, um, and one value. Uh, granted, we'd still be using SQL to access it, so, you know, maybe uh, we, we're, we're blurring some lines. But, you know, that's not necessarily the point. The point is that, that NoSQL is just a term for an ecosystem. So uh, an example of a NoSQL data store, um, again, is going to be non-relational. And uh, this is going to be a key value store. I mentioned it was the most prevalent type. So the, the nicest thing about a, um, a most key value stores is that there's no schema. We don't have to say ahead of time, this is what we are going to store. Uh, you know, we can just kind of throw really whatever we want into it. It can be as long as we want or, you know, a short, and uh, we're going to map a key to a value, where a key is some unique string and um, the value is some unique object. <clears throat> to give you a better understanding of this, we're going to go through some, um, some Redis code. Don't worry if you're not very familiar with, uh, with coding, just as long as you can kind of read along with me and, and sort of follow along you're good. So here we have our key value example. We're going to create a Redis object. Um, so we're going to call Redis.new and this is going to give us this lowercase Redis object. Uh, we can just say that this has a direct link to our database, our Redis data store. So on that data store we can call set. So we are setting foo, which is the key, to bar, which is the value. Um, you know, that operation completes, it, it sets the value, and then afterwards, we can say Redis get foo. Um, since foo is the key, it will get us bar. Uh, so again, you know that is that we have foo is the is the key, bar is the value, and um, if we get the key, if we call get on the key, then we receive back the value. So it's very simple. Um, for the same input of key, we get the same output of value. Um, and, and this is a very simplized, uh, a simple example. Um, but we, it also maps, as I pre previously said, to a relational database. It is similar to a database that can only ever use primary key. Um, so if you were to say a select statement from where you know, your primary key is equal to 3, uh, that's kind of similar to a, a key and a value. You, know, you have your value uh, locked away in your database, and your key is going to be this ID. Um, what what differs from a key value store is that um, in a database we could come in and say we want you know I don't know what the ID is but I know what the username is what the name is we want schneems just give us schneems um, and we can do that in a database relational database but we can't do that in a key value um, database or data store we can't say hey Redis give us whatever, you know, I want to know the name of the key to any value that is bar. You know, we, we just can't get that. In order to get our value, we have to have our key. So that is a, a limitation. Essentially, we are trading off um, accessibility for speed. There's only one way into that data, um, and it's very fast, but there's only one way into the data. So some background about NoSQL at Goala. We previously mentioned that we're using Postgres as our database, and we love Postgres, think it's great. In addition to that, we also use um, Redis from the previous example. It's a key value store, and this is going to store our likes. 
Um, you know, and you can like something, you can go wallet, we actually call them loves. Um, we can also store analytics arbitrarily. <clears throat> and we can, uh, in addition to that, we use memcache. It's a key value store. Um, and generally with that, we will be caching database results. Um, we also use Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra is described as an eventually consistent uh, with schema key value store. Um, you know, it's one of the most complex NoSQL uh, devices that we use. And um, it's going, it's very, very good at writing data. It writes data incredibly quickly, and we can do sequential reads um, very easily. So we can, it's perfect for things like feeds or timelines, where essentially whenever you're creating these stories or, um, you know, what some people would refer to as, as check-ins at locations, um, you know, that has to fan out to all of your friends. All of your friends have a timeline and, and want to see that information. Um, so essentially, instead of with a relational database, whenever they would reload the page, uh, it would, you know, construct this really nasty query, this big query, and say, oh, of all of your friends, you know, who has new information? Um, but with this, we could just write, because writing is so cheap and so easy, we can write it ahead of time and then easily read that back um, through a range query. Uh, finally, we use Solar as our search index. We do um, full text search, and it is fantastic. Love Solar. Uh, right now, it doesn't really truly fit into the scope of this talk, and so um, just wanted to mention that we use it, but we're not going to go into any details about how we use it. Uh, feel free to ask me after class or check into it um, if you got some time. So first off, we're going to start with Nemcache. A memcache is a key value store. It's open source. All of these uh, data stores are open source. Uh, memcache is distributed. We'll get to that just in a little bit. It is in memory only. Um, so what this means is you can write something to RAM, but if something happens to that computer, for some reason if it hiccups, if something bad goes on with the RAM, um, you will lose that data. So uh, it is incredibly fast, but it is, it is also volatile. So that means if you're writing once, but you don't know if it's going to be around forever, um, then it's not ACID compliant. It is, it is not durable. It is missing that D off of ACID. Uh, and we, could, we said, you know, we can, we can trade ACID for, uh, for performance, and that's what's been done in this situation. That's why we use it as a memory object caching uh, system in Gowalla. Uh, you know, here's just some super simple example. It's almost identical to... Um, uh, what we had previously with Redis, instead of Redis, we have memcache. So you can set items, set a key, and um, get a value. And if we get that same key, we get the same value. Where memcache is different from Redis is we can store entire objects. Uh, so here we have a, a user where the username is Schneem. So we're actually pulling this user from our database. Uh, don't worry again about the code. Um, and then we are going into memcache and setting our key of user3 equal to that user that we pulled from the database. Um, so that's going to have all of those methods, all of that data from that user. Uh, so then later on we can go and say memcache.get with our same key, user colon 3, and then we have our user from cache object. If we compare those two objects, user from cache with our original user, it's true. It is the exact same object. Um, and we can also call methods on that. So user from cache.username is going to return uh, schneems, which is exactly um, what we pulled from our database. It's what you'd expect. Um, so, you know, this is, this is super, super easy to work with. Uh, whatever data you want, you just cram in there. Uh, there is a one megabyte per key limit. Um, but, you know, typically if you structure your data well, then you don't, you won't run into that. Also, if you're using, you know, if you need to pull one megabytes, uh, you know, worth of data, potentially you can split it up into just storing IDs or uh, foreign keys or primary keys, either way. Uh, so how we use memcache at Gowalla. Uh, typically, or I mean almost in entirely, we use it to cache things. Um, so what exactly do we mean by this? Uh, we want to keep keep queries from actually um, hitting our database. So if we have something in our cache, we'll try to pull it from our cache before we ever even hit our database or Postgres. 
this is great because not only is you know that really, really, really quick since this is an in-memory database and you can pull things from it a lot quicker than you can from a database. I mean, you know, keep in mind all things being considered in our situation. Um, a lot of people might get upset if I if I say that, but uh, generally, memcache one memcache query will be, uh, in my experience, much quicker than one database query, even on a indexed primary key. Um, uh, so essentially, you know, we get a speed boost right up front, and we also see less load on the database. So really, it's a win-win. The end result is the user sees a quicker page load time. So what type of items do we want to cache? We want to um, cache items that aren't changed frequently, or that are change that change infrequently. So we have users. Um, users rarely change their email address, um, and by rarely I mean, you, you, you know, they could even if they change it once a day, that would be relatively infrequently compared to some data that we write. Um, we have uh, spots, places. Um, many of the the details of a spot are not going to change day to day. You know, the lat long of a spot, the address of a spot, the name of a spot is not really going to change. You know, that much. Um, we also want to cache anything that is going to be an expensive SQL query. Um, and an example of this might be uh, friend IDs for users. So <clears throat> rather than we, we have a uh, friends or, or, or you know following table, and rather than having to look at all of the people who I follow um, and you know doing this kind of a join query, I can just do one lookup in memcache and get all of those keys or all of those IDs. It's great. Uh, we also store user IDs for people visiting spots. Uh, so really, you know, if it's expensive, you know, try to put it in memcache, please. If it is uh, changed infrequently, try to put it in memcache. Um, you know, previously I was talking about uh, uh, horizontal scaling with a relational database. Here is an example of how memcache is horizontally scaled. Um, you can just have one memcache node, but it's a lot more uh, useful. It's very convenient if you have many, especially since it has all of its all of its stores all of its objects in memory. It uses a lot of RAM. It needs a lot of RAM, and unfortunately, RAM is a very limited resource on most servers. So we can get around this by having multiple multiple servers. Uh, this is a diagram of what a distributed memcache cluster would look like. So a query uh, basically comes into the cluster, and based on its key, it will get assigned to a, um, a, a different node. You know, maybe if it comes in with a key of, um, you know, users 3, it might end up in node uh, B. Or if it's users 87, it might end up in node C. Um, either way, as long as you use the same key, um, with the same cluster, you'll 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 get the same um, you'll get the same node. Uh, if you're interested in this, the algorithm for doing this is called consistent hashing. It's incredibly cool. It's also implemented for you in most Redis libraries, so or at least in Ruby. So all you have to do is use the library, and you get this for free. Um, so here's an example of adding another node. Uh, it's very simple. All we have to do is bring it up, um, you know, throw a memcache in it, and then let the rest of our system know about this node. Uh, and our um, gem will take care of it for us. This is great. Um, we can easily add more nodes. One of the uh, convenient things about this is uh, that since it is volatile, we already have to plan for our system to not have that information. Um, so we can populate these nodes very, very quickly. <clears throat> oh, looks like I misspelled memcache there. Um, but here's some reasons why people love memcache. I love memcache. Um, so you can use it, well, and why memcache and the database works very, very well together. Um, so we use them together. If, a, if memcache doesn't have a value, then we fetch it from the database and then set the value from, set the key from the database. So essentially, if you if you have a cache, it's called a cache miss when that happens. Um, if you if it happens once, it won't happen again immediately. We'll have to wait until uh, something happens with the memory and that goes out of scope. 
Or um, probably the hardest thing with dealing with memcache and caching in general is uh, cache invalidation. You'll hear computer science uh, say that there's only two truly hard, hard things with um, programming, and that's uh, naming things in cache invalidation. Unfortunately, cache invalidation is you know, very true. Um, if we're storing items that uh, update infrequently, such as users, whenever they do update their email address, you do need to go through and either rewrite the value that's in memcache or say, hey, don't even look in memcache, just the next time we'll have a cache, mitch, cache, cache uh, miss and we will refetch the data from the database. So that's, uh, that's pretty much um, memcache in a, in a nutshell. Um, so next up is going to be Redis. Redis, again, another key value store. It is also open source. Um, it is not distributed, so it cannot do that fancy horizontal scaling thing, unfortunately. Um, it is incredibly quick, extremely quick, and uh, it has been described as a uh, data structure server. Uh, Redis is actually ACID compliant, as opposed to just storing those data, those values in, in memory, um, it does some fancy things along the lines of, uh, it actually does store data in memory, but in addition to that, it, um, I believe, uses journaling <clears throat> to make sure that no data is lost. So once you put something in Redis, it will stay in Redis. Even if the server goes down, once you bring it back up again, all of the data you put in there will still be in there. So if you don't remember, here's our original example. We can set foo to bar and then get foo and get bar. You know, hopefully this... Example will be ingrained in your sleep. Uh, so this isn't really that interesting. We could do this with with uh, with memcache. What gets really interesting is when we start taking a look at uh, the Redis data types. So here we have uh, a couple of different data types that Redis supports. It supports strings, hashes, lists, um, sets, as well as sorted sets. Um, so here's an example of using one of those data types. All right, we are going to use sets. Um, so instead of um, the previous method, which was set, as well as get, we're going to use sAd and members. So a set, if you're not familiar, uh, is similar to an array, essentially. Um, it does have some special properties that I'm not going to get into now, but uh, here in our second line, we are going to um, add, use the use a, the key foo and add the entry of bar to our our set. Um, or you know, if you'd like to think of it as an array, it's it's okay. Just understand that there are some differences, and you might need to look those up if you want to use this in depth. Um, if we then come back and call members on that same key, which is foo, then we will get an array back that contains our entry bar. Um, you know, exactly like we expected. If I then take that same key and then call um, s add again, then uh, with a different value, it, in, in this case, uh, my key or my value is fly, and then I call members on the same key, then we get a result of uh, a, a set that contains bar fly, you know, separated, two different elements. Um, so to, to leverage some of these, um, data sets and and you know if you're interested in Redis there's a lot of great articles um, you know some of them like learn Redis data sets in 30 minutes or less uh, all of these have pros and cons um, advantages and disadvantages uh, you know typically I love uh, using sorted sets as well as as hashes uh, I find the most useful the most um, unique and you can do uh, atomic data operations on these which is which is great um, so, well, this was an example of sets. Uh, we currently use hashes to implement um, our likable module. So you can, act, if you're using Ruby, you can go to uh, github.com slash gowalla slash likable. Um, there's all of the source code. You can just download it. You can uh, use it as a, as a Ruby gem. I also released a screencast showing you how you can integrate it into a Ruby on Rails application. 
Um, and you know, Redis gives us a very fast response time. Here we have um, on GoWall the ability to like things. There's a story of me in a panda hat um, that um, you know I have liked because I think it's a, a fantastic story. And um, you know, it needs to store a bunch of information. It needs to store when it was created. We also need to know uh, how many people liked this thing. It shows a total count. Who liked it? And um, do the inverse. It needs. I need to know, uh, for, given a user, um, what objects have has that user liked. Uh, so that you know, that's quite a bit of data that we can store in a relatively efficient manner using hashes. Um, the the idea being that we knew the problem scope pretty fully before we even started implementing. So um, Redis is going to give us the ability to have many, many, many queries on one page. Uh, you know, we have about 50 queries on a page, and really we have like you know um, maybe like you know one millisecond per query ish, um, and that's just kind of spitballing. Um, you know, might not even be that. Uh, so it's very fast, it's very flexible, and uh, because of this you can like anything on our site. And any new feature, it's, it's trivial to add. Uh, some of that, the uh, flexibility there is given to us by the lack of a schema. We can just, we can throw any data type uh, given a different key, or not any data type, but um, basically our, our key helps us separate out that data. So as long as we can generate a unique key, um, we can store data. It's that simple. Uh, so finally, we're going to be talking about Cassandra. Again, it's open source. Um, it is distributed, but in a different way than Memcache. Uh, it is a key value store. It uses something called eventual consistency. Uh, and this means it is, it is, it is eventually acid. Uh, it is not actually acid because it's not consistent. It, it violates... Um, you know, the, the consistency principle. But it, for all intents and purposes, it's very reliable, um, at least in our experience. Um, so it does use a schema, so you still do have to kind of use a schema, and uh, it's a non-traditional sort of odd schema. Um, you have to generate column families and yeah, super column families or something along those lines. Uh, so let's go into how things are distributed with Cassandra. So here again we have our we have a cluster, and in this cluster we have data that will go into a node. Um, say it might go into node B. Um, from there, once once it's written, um, it'll it'll go ahead and it'll return and it'll it'll say, you know, it's done processing. But eventually, it will propagate that data to. A subset of all of our nodes, not to all of them, but you know, to uh, until it gets um, a quorum, um, or, or basically just a, a couple of nodes. So in this case, eventually, at some point in time in the future, B is going to tell C, "Hey, you know, I stored some data. Here's what it is," and B is going to tell D, "Hey, I stored some data. Here's what it is." And likewise, um, C is writing data to B, is writing data to D. You know, all of these nodes are are writing data. Um, to one another, and the idea being that um, uh, your data is not going to have a single point of failure. If, if one of these nodes goes down, don't worry about it because your data is on another node. Um, you know, typically you can take a node down and then bring it back up with, with um, minimal to no data loss. But even so, what's awesome about Cassandra is, you know, just for fun, if you want to, you could pull the plug out of one of your nodes in a production server and... Um, your website, if you've done your, your nodes correctly, uh, shouldn't even hiccup. It should be fine. Um, so, you know, that's Cassandra from a um, operation and kind of the back-end uh, perspective. But what do we actually do with it? Uh, we use Cassandra to write our activity feeds, to write and read our activity feeds. Uh, again, Cassandra has is... Um, optimized for writes, different databases. Every different database is going to be optimized for something different, or data store, I should say. In this case, it's optimized for writes and sequential reads. And it just so happens that if you write activity, whenever you want to read it, um, typically you'll want to sequentially read that activity. You know, most people don't say, all right, I want to know everything that happened today, five days ago, and ten days ago. They say, no, no, no I want to know 
you know, today, yesterday, the day before that, the day before that, the day before that, since all that's sequential, um, you know, Cassandra's a perfect fit. If you want to m know more information about Cassandra um, and how we use it, uh, you can check out github.com slash gowalla slash chronologic. Um, it is uh, the home of all of our code that we use uh, to, to do all of this, to, to map um, our data to the Cassandra data model. Um, yeah, definitely give it a shot. Uh, we have, actually I don't know if we have a, yeah, yeah, we have a, we do have a, a Ruby gem as well if you're using Ruby. So, you know, at the end of all this, you might be saying, ah, oh, that's a ton of information and I, you know, I still don't even know what a database is or what NoSQL is. It's an ecosystem. It's, um, but, you know, more importantly, you should be asking yourself, should I use NoSQL? Um, and if you are, you know, hopefully you're asking, which database or which you know NoSQL uh, data store should I use? Uh, my answer to that is to pick the right tool. So every data store is going to have different trade-offs. Um, every data store is going to have strengths and weaknesses. If you that you know a lot of times you'll hear, uh, well, this data store got a great benchmark on this, or this data store got a great benchmark on that. Um, if you don't understand the what the benchmark is actually measuring then you're not understanding which of them is fast or which of them is not. Um, and also things are, are, are relative. Um, one operation, um, if you know, in a, a relational database might be incredibly quick uh, and incredibly, s in, a, in a relational database, but slow in a NoSQL store um, and vice versa. Until you can model your problem fully, uh, you won't really know. So my, uh, my best advice to you is to let you know that there is no magic bullet. There is no, like, you should have used MySQL, or you should have used Postgres, or you should have used Cassandra, or you should have used Mongo. Um, you know, that's, there, there is no, if you build a product on a data store, and it works, and it can scale at least, you know, somewhat, you, that is successful. If there, you know, if there's something out there that is can scale it even better, even faster, even, you know, more, then, you know, great. Eventually, hopefully, you can switch over to that. But, uh, you know, you switch only if you need to, if you see that coming in the future. Um, you know, typically, you uh, do as Goala has done, and we have sort of a, a hybrid. We have a relational and a, um, a set of NoSQL databases, just because... Those new SQL databases fit our problems perfectly. You know that's exactly what we wanted to do. Um, we did our research, we did our homework, um, we had a couple of uh, uh, projects we played around with, and you know it, it worked great. We did some some testing and some benchmarks against some real world data before we turned it on on Chronologic. We were doing all that through the database, um, you know, and of course we like we tested this before we actually put it into production. Uh, so importantly, understand and. Uh, and know your options. Um, know the more you know about what you're trying to accomplish with this data, the more you understand uh, your own restrictions. And some of these, uh, it, it's all about trade-offs, as I mentioned before. And if you understand what you can sacrifice, then you can gain performance, or you can gain you know uh, better metrics, or you can gain more searchability, or more flexibility. Um, but uh, you know, typically, if you're getting started. Just pick whatever data store you understand and model your data in that. Uh, that will give you infinite amounts of, of insight. If you try to say, all right, I'm going to start a new project, and I hear, uh, you know, Mongo is good. So I'm going to use Mongo for this project no matter what. Um, you know, that's a good way to learn Mongo, but maybe um, not the best way to have a working project. Um, you want to kind of... Uh, you know, if you're working on something you, you expect is going to be consumer grade, you expect it's going to be production worthy, um, it's always nice to work with your strengths. Um, and I generally try to take my, my side projects and that's where I work on my weaknesses. Um, but, you know, don't, don't hesitate to, to try and throw one of these into your apps. You know, your side project might be, um, you know, putting this on a staging server of your, you know, your your system and seeing if uh, if one of these things works or not. Um, you know, uh, likable 
was, uh, you know, developed in, in house and, um, you know, didn't know if it would fully, uh, meet all of our needs until we actually just put it on a staging server and uh, played around with it for a while. And eventually, we added a couple of features. You know, we took away a couple, and um, it it worked out really well. So we ended up uh, ended up sticking with it. So again, just stick with uh, with what you know and just you know try it out. Uh, does anyone have any questions? <laughs>